Thank you, Dwight. You know, it's so hard today for people, especially young children, to decipher what is true and what is not. Because so many of the myths that we hear about today so closely resemble the facts. And you know, in life, when you stop and analyze the fact that many of these myths are brought into the religious arena. We were talking today about uh, many of the religious concepts that we have that are founded upon the Word of God and many of them that are mythological in nature. And how is it that people can do such things to the teaching of God's Word? You know, there is absolutely nothing to do, the resurrection of Christ has nothing to do with Easter eggs and bunny rabbits. Now, but we have a lot of people, and I'm not saying it's wrong, if you want to have an Easter bunny or you want to go out and hunt for eggs, and if you have Alzheimer's, I guess you can hunt your eggs yourself. But uh, at any rate, I know one thing, that uh, many of the things that we hear today concerning religion are so wrapped up in some of the mythological concepts. What does Santa Claus and eight tiny reindeer and little elves and Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer and the little drummer boy have to do with the birth of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I want you to think with me tonight, and as I said, there are many mythological stories, a lot of nursery rhymes. One you have probably heard out of all the nursery rhymes that you have heard, probably the one that stands out most in your mind is Mary had a little lamb. It says Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Well, I want to talk to you tonight about Mary's lamb. And that lamb was the son of Mary and the son of God. And the Bible in John 1 and verse 29 heralds Jesus not only to be the Savior of the world, to be the one who was to come into the world, and as I said this morning, the Paschal Lamb, that is to make that passage possible for us to go and be with God in heaven. But John, when he beheld him for the first time, says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It is not by accident or by chance that the Bible refers to Jesus as a lamb. But you will remember that he is also referred to as the shepherd. You know, if you don't know too much about lambs, you couldn't really appreciate Psalms 23. My little grandson, uh, Clayton, raised a lamb. His picture was up here this morning and for FFA this year. I learned a few things about lambs I didn't know. But I know one thing that from his experience that lambs are dependent upon their shepherd. When you read Psalms 23, think about how often this lamb had to be led. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. It's not that I found the green pastures myself, but he led me to the green pastures. He made me lie down. He restores my soul. I don't do it. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's the one who prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. No, you and I are lambs of God as well. When Jesus discussed with Peter the concept of his love for Jesus, he would say, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know I love you. He says, feed my sheep. 
He said, do you really love me? He says, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And he says the third time, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs, my lambs. Think about what John said, behold, the Lamb of God. You know, the word behold is an interesting word in and of itself. The word behold was often used in New Testament times in the Greek language to capture the attention of people who may be wandering off. Behold, listen up, we say. The Lamb of God is among you. I want us to talk a little bit tonight about Mary's little lamb. Jesus was a spotless lamb. The reason I know that is when Isaiah made the prophecy about the coming of the Son of God, well, the great prophet referred to him as the lamb. As a lamb that would go before her shearers and he would open not his mouth. His, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation, he said. There was no comeliness about him that we should desire him. But he would refer to him as the spotless lamb. The lamb without blemish. Did you know, if you go back and you trace this back in the book of Numbers under, under the law, in Numbers 28 and verse 9, that before a lamb could actually be offered in a sacrificial way, it had to be examined thoroughly and then declared as one who was spotless. You know, sometimes people are willing to offer things that are blemished. They're willing to offer unto God a lot of things that they're going to get rid of anyway. But God emptied heaven and gave his best. And under Old Testament law, that lamb that was to be offered in a sacrificial way for the sins of people had to be a lamb that was not tarnished by blots, or blemishes. He could not be deformed. Couldn't have defects. You know, sometimes it's kind of hard to give up something like that, isn't it? But that's what God asked them to do, to give our best. As I said, that animal that was deformed in some fashion or another couldn't, couldn't be offered. You don't give God your second best. Not only was he the son of God, but he was the sinless son of God. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. And in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says that he was without sin. He knew sin. He knew it. Because he took away our sin. But he knew no sin in the sense that he had sinned. He was perfect in every way. Without spot or wrinkle. And isn't it interesting that when Paul describes the nature of the church in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, he asks for the church to be without spot or wrinkle or blemish. But Paul says, for our sake, he, that is God, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, Peter says, Who did no sin, neither was there guile, and that word guile means deceit, hypocrisy, found in his mouth, because he was the pure lamb of God, dying for a wretched and a sinful world. But not only was he the spotless lamb of God, he was the submissive lamb of God. 
The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, though he were a son, or Romans chapter 5, verse 8 also, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Being made free, he became and perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation to all of them that obey him. If Christ ever taught anything in the world concerning the characteristics of Christianity, certainly this was one of them. Well, he would take a little child and put the child in the midst, and he would say to his disciples who were quibbling and arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom of God, Jesus took that little child and said, unless you become converted and become as this little child, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. James says that we're to humble ourselves in the sight of God, and he will lift us up. Humility is always one, one of the great characteristics of the Christ, Mary's little lamb. Submissive in every way. He went to the cross out of submission. He wasn't constrained. Oh, I know the Roman officers who nailed him to the cross at the clamoring of the Jews. The Romans were the ones that really carried out the dirty work. Oh, the Jews wanted him out of the way. They thought he was some kind of mythological creature, as we said at the onset of our lesson tonight. They didn't believe anything that Christ was saying. They thought he was an imposter. He certainly was not the Christos or the Messiah who was going to come into the world but that he was an imposter. But you know, if you had, and they had gone back to read the prophecy of Isaiah, especially chapter 40, where uh, John the Baptist would be the actually forerunner and preparing the way for the Christ who would to come. And Isaiah 53, that describes him as the Lamb of God and all that he would go through, surely they would have known with great assurance like that centurion that stood at the foot of the cross when Jesus gave up the ghost. And he said, surely this man was the son of God. Christ was the submissive lamb. You know, go back to Psalms 23 with me. David said, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Makes me do it. You know, sometimes you have to make lambs lay down. You know, God imposes his will on us at times. We don't always understand. It's like Jamie was, uh, was excuse me, not Jamie, Jeremy was praying a moment ago. When you go through the things that you have to go through in your life, you don't always understand what you're going through, but it is God who is chastising you, who is blessing you, didn't Jesus say, those that I love, I rebuke and I chasten? You know what the word chasten means? Discipline. I bring you into subjection. And we put on that spirit of Mary's little lamb. Jesus was not forced into that role of a sacrifice. Well, even the devil knew that. For the devil would take Jesus, you remember, immediately following his baptism at the hands of John the Baptist. And you remember that he took him to a high mountain. He said, you know what? I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And then he put him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, why don't you jump off? Because you know, you know that God has given you charge concerning legions of angels that you would not even hurt your little toe by doing so. But Jesus said, I know that. But it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus went into his role as the sacrificial lamb of God, the Paschal lamb. On his own. Could have resisted. 
Think about what he said. I lay down. I lay down my life. You don't force me, even though the Romans were going to nail him to the cross. He said, you don't force me. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep, and I will take it again. And he did. This is the creator of the universe that we're talking about tonight. For he was involved in the creation, for the Bible says in John, the first chapter, verse 1 and following, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And God said, let us make man in our image after our own likeness. That's a plural pronoun. In the Hebrew, the word Elohim, let us make man in our image. And he could have called down angel after angel, Matthew 26 and verse 53. But as Mary's little lamb, he endured the shame and the pain without uttering a word. Amazing, isn't it? We're going through pain and shame. We utter a lot of words, don't we? But not Mary's little lamb. For Isaiah said, he opened not his mouth. He submitted to the Father's will and paid the price for our sins. Peter said, you were not purchased with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Son of God. He was the submissive lamb. And when he did speak, it was not in retaliation for what they did. Think about those seven statements on the cross. I thirst. Or when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His prayer was for the forgiveness of those who were tormenting him, discouraging him, and by nailing him to the cross. And the final words of Jesus, it is finished. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is finished. The sacrifice has been made. The blood has been shed. And the blood now becomes efficacious. Jesus was surrendered to the Father's will. And even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the cross was just a short, time away he was found in that garden you remember praying in Luke 22 and 42 father not my will but your will be done but thirdly he was a sacrificial lamb you know the word sacrifice is not a real popular word in today's economy is it because people don't like to sacrifice we don't like to sacrifice our time. We don't like to sacrifice our money. We don't like to sacrifice our energy. But Jesus was willing to give it all. Just like you would bleed a lamb. A horrible sight. That's a horrible sight. But I wanted you to see what it was like. And then when you see Jesus nailed to the cross, shedding his blood for your sins, then you understand how significant his death on the cross really was. And all the rest that would take place after the death of Jesus would be meaningless had he not been that sacrificial lamb. It wasn't enough for Jesus to be sinless or surrendered. He had to suffer and die before the sin of the world could be taken away. Hebrews 9 and verse 22. And that's why Paul would write in that particular text, without the shedding of blood, there is no 
remission. So the story of Jesus Christ of Nazareth or Mary's little lamb didn't stop at the manger when he was born. But he became the lamb of sacrifice. And I'm thankful to God tonight that he gave his life. You know, when you go back and you really look at the life of Jesus, it's amazing. And here we are 2,000 years after Christ died as that Paschal Lamb, talking about his love for mankind talking about his humility, his submissiveness, the specialty of this lamb. But they took the Lord Jesus Christ outside the city of Jerusalem. And as you know, he was crucified for the sins of all mankind. What a weight. What a weight of sin in the shedding of his blood. The lamb was for an offering for you and for me. And when that blood was pouring forth from his body and his life was dwindling away, it was as if a giant billboard had been placed out there before us talking about the awesome love and the sacrificial nature of Mary's little lamb. For though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. Then being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all of them who love him and obey him. Romans 5 and verse 8. But last of all, Mary's little lamb was a saving lamb. You know, in Psalms 23, David felt real secure because he knew his shepherd would protect him. He said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, when you think of Jesus not only being the lamb but being our shepherd, and he is described as the good shepherd in the book of John, the 15th chapter. And when he tells that parable about the man who had a hundred sheep and one went astray, I want you to notice what happens in this story. The shepherd goes after the lamb. The lamb doesn't wander its way back home. And Isaiah says that we like sheep have all gone astray. And the shepherd went after the lamb. The lamb didn't meander and finally come back to the fold. But the shepherd went to find him. And when he came back, he said, I have found my sheep. That went astray. You know, I think God goes in search for us at times. We may not understand it. But I believe tonight God is searching the city of Palestine for lost lambs. I want to make a correction here. I said he was the saving lamb. He is the saving lamb. Tonight, he is the saving lamb. Mary's little lamb was a special lamb. It was a sacrificial lamb, but Mary's lamb, thank God, was a saving lamb. And just as David said, he leads me beside the still water. Do you know that Jesus is still leading people to the water of baptism? He's leading us to the water for us to obey him. 
And he said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16. If that's true, it makes baptism necessary and absolutely necessary for us to become the sheep and the lambs of God. For it is the only way that we can apply the blood of Jesus. In David's psalm that we call the shepherd psalm, David said, he anoints my head with oil. Well, God isn't asking us to be anointed with oil tonight, but to be anointed by the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. There is nothing greater that you could say or words that could fall from your lips in these words, I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. My question to those of you tonight is, are you covered by the blood of Jesus? Are you a Christian? But better yet, for those of you that are Christians, you know how you're covered by the blood of Jesus today? Sometimes people think, well, I'm just naturally covered by the blood of the Lamb. Not so. Back up a minute. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from our sin. Here's the if. If we walk in the light, and if we, my friend, tonight as Christians are not walking in the light, the Lamb's blood is not covering us. It only covers those who are walking in the light. Now, that's what God said. And so I ask you tonight, are you covered by the blood of Jesus? When you sin and you err, as uh, Jeremy prayed a moment ago, was the blood of Jesus covering you? I hope and I pray that it is. But if you're not walking in the light of God's will, you better take another look. So let us stand and let us sing. <laughs>